begin today to talk about the Moa Day. Now, if you go with me to Leviticus chapter 23, and while you're doing that, I'm going to come before the Lord in prayer, seeking his words to speak to his people. Of you know our Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending us the word incarnate, the Torah incarnate, who showed us how to live out Torah. Lord, you gave us the example that we need to be able to follow. You said that, uh, come and follow me. You said, Yeshua. So, Lord, here we are today on this day that you sanctified from all the other days of the week. Lord, we want to know more about how to follow you. We want to know more about your holy days. We want to know you more. Lord, may we grab a hold of the seat seat, the fringes of our Lord's garment, and follow along with him all the days of our life. Lord, give me your words to speak to your people, I pray, in Yeshua's name. And all God's people said. Leviticus chapter 23. From Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse number 1, God says, Tell the people of Israel the designated times of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as holy convocations. These are the Moadei Adonai. The Moadei Adonai. A holy convocation, a Mikra Kadesh, is a assembly together of holy people, of God's holy people. So we're assembling together on this Moed called Shabbat, the weekly Sabbath day. These are the Lord's holy days, as we talked about. They're not the Jewish holy days. We're not trying to make people Jews here. We're trying to make people biblically uh, obedient here. That's what we're trying to do here. So these are the designated times of the Lord. The Moadei Adonai. In the Hebrew, Moadei Adonai. Designated times of the Lord. These are holy convocations. We come together. Now we're right now approaching next month, of course, as I talked about earlier. Next month, we begin on the second, on the night of the second, we begin Yom Teruah, which is the day of trumpets. Also known as Rosh Hashanah, where that night, on the 2nd, we begin the year 5777. And right now we're in the month of Tishri. We just finished the month of Elul. The month of Elul is the month that we had to begin to turn our hearts toward God, to begin to examine our life, and to begin to go ahead and turn away from our sin. These high holy days, the high holy days are the 10 days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the day, Yom meaning day, Kippur meaning atonement. Today I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about Yom Kippur. And then finally the fall feast end with the eight days of Sukkot or tabernacles or booths. Now, some of you have probably heard that from many prophecy teachers or teachers, that when Yeshua came, he fulfilled the spring feast in his first coming. And he'll fulfill the fall feast in his second coming. Well, I disagree with that. It wasn't until I started, I believed it too for a long time, it wasn't until I started working on my dissertation that I realized that Yeshua fulfilled every single one of these holy days in his first coming in part and he won't completely fulfill them until his second coming so what we're going to see here is here's your Shabbat the first Moed the seventh day Sabbath now six is the number of a man and as the extension goes for six thousand years will be under the rule of man, bad government the seventh year is Shabbat, just like the seventh day is Shabbat. Just like every seven years, you've got a Shabbat of years known as Shemitah. So the 7,000th year, the last thousand years of mankind will be that of the Messianic reign. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, you're going to see that those who were beheaded for the Messiah during the time of the Great Tribulation are going to go ahead and rise from the dead. They're going to be resurrected. And it says here in Revelation 20, verse 4, 
It says, Then I saw thrones, and those on them received the authority to judge. How appropriate, since we're in the, the Parsha of Shoftim, which means judge, judges. And it says, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for testifying about Yeshua. And by the way, more and more, as ISIS keeps going, there are more and more souls that are being beheaded for the sake of our Messiah Yeshua. I submit to you that that last man-made government that of the anti-Messiah, or the Antichrist as he's called, is going to be an Islamic caliphate or caliph. It's their religion that typically beheads people. And it says, and proclaiming the word of God, also those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands. Listen, they came to life and ruled with Messiah for a thousand years. Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. So the last thousand years of mankind on this earth, before there's a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21, is going to be the messianic reign the 7,000th year. So what we're looking at here is we're seeing that Yeshua being the Lord of the Sabbath is going to be reigning for the last or the Sabbath thousand years. Now that's a future thing to be fulfilled, right? However, he said, while he was walking on this earth, I am the what? The Lord of the Sabbath. And he is the one that says it is lawful to do good on Shabbat. So Coming from him, this is what we need to hear. Then it goes on to say in verse number four, these are the designated times of the Lord. Well, we start in verse five with Passover. Yeshua was the Passover lamb. We sang that song earlier. He is the Passover lamb. But the Passover lamb never, ever, ever does away with sin. Period. It doesn't. The Passover lamb, the only thing the lamb did, it's blood on the doorposts and the lentils that allowed the Lord to pass over that household so as not to put judgment on that household with the death of the firstborn. That's it. Nowhere will you see the Passover lamb forgiving sin from the Tanakh. Now we're going to get into Yom Kippur, into more depth here. It's only Yom Kippur that's coming up that has the ability to forgive the sin of the nation Israel and all those who are grafted in to the nation Israel. So Passover was only partially fulfilled in the first coming. Yeshua said on his Passover with his disciples, I will not drink the fruit of the vine with you again until when? Until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. You see, Passover isn't even totally fulfilled yet because Passover is not complete until you drink the last cup. You see? Yeshua's not drinking the last cup until we're with him in the kingdom. So he did fulfill in part Passover, but he did not fulfill totally Passover. There's a lot more to it. We'll bring it up when we get closer to Passover. How about first fruits? Look at... Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 9, or 10. The first fruits. It's supposed to be accepted and waived the day after the Sabbath. Now, let me ask you this. Yeshua is the first fruit from the dead. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, did he not? But what does first fruits indicate? What does it imply? It implies that there are others following. If something's first, what's following? Us! Now, I do know a few people resurrected from the dead after Yeshua died on the cross. But we still haven't seen the fulfillment of first fruits until when? Like the dead and the Messiah that came because they were beheaded for the sake of Messiah? When did they come to life? They came to life just at the beginning of the thousand year reign. So we don't see first fruits until the Lord comes again. How about uh, where you have unleavened bread? I jumped over that accidentally. The Feast of Matzah. Matzah is unleavened bread. Well, Yeshua was sinless. Leaven usually represents sin in the scripture. Yeshua was sinless. But folks, how about us? 
It's not totally fulfilled yet then. Until we are in our glorified, sinless bodies. That's the goal of the resurrection. Hey, I don't want to be in this thing anymore. As Paul would say in Romans chapter 7, the law of sin and death or the law is the law contained in our members of our bodies. It's not the Torah. It's what we're wearing here is the law of sin and death. And the law of sin and death does what? It causes us to fight against keeping God's Torah. So until you and I are in our sinless bodies or glorified bodies, matzah is not fulfilled yet. Then again, we see, and I'm going to be talking more about this in depth in the fall feast, uh, we've got uh, Yom Teruah, the day of uh, trumpets. He did fulfill that, and I'm going to get more into depth on that next Shabbat, not this Shabbat. I'm going to talk more about Yom Kippur today. But in depth, I'm going to show you how he fulfilled this fall feast next Shabbat. Today I'm going to be talking about Yom Kippur. The reason why I'm doing Yom Kippur first is because I want to set a, a statement that if Yeshua fulfilled even one fall feast in his first coming, you with me? If he fulfilled even one fall feast in his first coming, then what we've been taught is wrong. That Yeshua did not just fulfill the spring feast in his first coming, he also fulfilled the fall feast in his first coming. You see? If I can prove to you he even did one fall feast, that's going to topple that domino down, which is going to topple the rest of their statement down, because it's not true. Yeshua fulfilled all of them in his first coming. Yeshua will completely fulfill all of them in his second coming. And then finally, Sukkot. Yeshua fulfilled this feast. Sukkot is his birthday. December 25th, the birth of the sun. Didn't we just read in today's Torah portion not, I mean, not to worship the sun? Hello? Where do you think December 25th came from in the church? Sun worship. That's why I went through the church history stuff with you all. It may not have made any sense to you. You may have thought it might have been worthless. But I went through church history so you can see how this stuff crept in. Hey, if the body of Messiah is supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, why is it that we brought stuff into the church that helps us to dampen the power of the Holy Spirit? Why? It's because men brought in what they were comfortable with. They were comfortable with pagan worship. They brought it in. And according to what we read in the scripture today, those men should have been stoned to death for doing that. You see? But they weren't. They were allowed to let their teaching go on. So what I'm going to be showing you is in depth Yom Kippur. In Leviticus 23, Yom Teruah is the day of trumpets. Yeshua did fulfill that in his first coming. And he will fulfill it in a second when we hear the sound of the shofar. You know, at the blast of the trumpet, Matthew chapter 24, what's going to happen to us? As Paul said, the dead and the Messiah is going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain will rise after them. That is coming. So what we see here is a partial fulfillment, fulfillment in his first coming, getting to that next Shabbat, and a complete one when we are all resurrected from the dead at the sound of the shofar. Yom Kippur is the second of the fall feasts. By the way, the ten days between Yom Teruah, which is on the first of the month, this, by the way, is the only uh, Moed, appointed time of the Lord, that ever occurs on the Rosh Kadesh, the first day of a month, the new moon. This is the only one. That's it. On the seventh month, the first of the month. Now we begin our count to the tenth day of the seventh month. That's Yom Kippur. But between day one, which we call Rosh Hashanah, and day ten, those are known as the Yomim, which are days, Norayim, the days of uh, where we go ahead and have the days of awe. The days of awe are the ten days between Yom uh, Teruah and Yom Kippur, where we should be bearing our hearts to God in repentance. We should be looking at the sins in our lives and ask God to forgive us. And then greater than that, as our Lord Yeshua would say, 
we need to forgive those who have sinned against us. If we don't forgive those who've sinned against us, how's the Lord going to forgive us for our sins against him? So we're going to get more to talking later about the Noreen, uh, Yomim Noreen, the days of all. Yom Kippur, we're going to talk about more today. And during Yom Kippur, this is also a Shabbat. That's why I gave you the days of the Shabbat that you've got to take off. And what we see here on Yom Kippur, it's a permanent regulation, just like the weekly Sabbath. It's a forever regulation throughout all your generations. And in this case, no matter where you live, no matter where you live, it's going to be a Sabbath day. And finally, Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, on the 15th day of the seventh month. That's five days after Yom Kippur, the Feast of Sukkot, seven days for the Lord. In John 1.14, would say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the reality is, that word, skinuo, uh, skinuo, is the Greek word, and that first translation, if you went to Strong's 4637, the first translation of that word, that it should be, it should be tabernacled among us. The Lord's birthday was when he tabernacled among us. According to John, you've got enough scripture in, in the scripture uh, to be able to prove that Yeshua's birthday was not December 25th. That it was on the first day of Sukkot. There's eight days total in Sukkot. So if a baby Hebrew boy was born on the first day, what happens to the baby Hebrew boy on the eighth day? He's circumcised. But he's also given a name. Girls, you have an advantage. You're named on day one. No need, unless you're in Islam, no need to worry about circumcision. I'm serious. On day eight, a Hebrew boy circumcised. Why do you think this feast is eight days long? Secondly, what must every Hebrew family do on this day, on the first day. They must have a what? Sukkah, or a tabernacle. More about this later, but let me give you a hint. When they went to Bethlehem, they found that there was no place for them to go. God provided the solution for the housing problem because every household had to have a Sukkah. God provided the housing for Yeshua to be born. First day of Sukkot. Makes a whole lot more sense. More about that later. Sukkot is one of the three pilgrimage feasts. I need to talk about that briefly. The Shalosh Regalim. Shalosh. Three Regalim pilgrimage feasts. There were three of them in Scripture. Pesach, that's Passover. Shavuot, 50 days later, known as Weeks or Pentecost, and finally Sukkot. Ancient Israelite men living in the kingdom of Judah would make a pilgrimage to the temple every year on these three feasts. Exodus 23, 14 through 17, God says, offer a sacrifice to me three times each year. The festival of Matzah, unleavened bread, the festival of Shavuot, that's weeks, and the festival of Sukkot. Three times a year, each male among you must appear before the Lord your God. Keep the festival of Matzahs, of Shavuot, and Sukkot. Three times a year, all your males shall present themselves before the God, the Master, Exodus 34, 18 through 23. Deuteronomy 16, safeguard the month of the standing grain so that you'll be able to keep the Passover to God your Lord. Then it goes on to say you should to celebrate the festival of Shavuot to God your Lord. And then it goes on to say you shall celebrate the festival of Sukkot for seven days. Three times every year, all your males shall be seen in the presence of God your Lord in the place that he will choose on the festival of Matzah, the festival of Shavuot, and the festival of Sukkot. God says that numerous times. I think we need to listen to him. By the way, since the destruction of the second temple, this is not incumbent upon anybody because there's no temple in each one of these they had to appear with something in their hands from the fruit of their uh, fields 
and present it unto the Lord. Well, there's no temple to do that now. However, do I want to say this? It doesn't hurt to go to the land, and it doesn't hurt to go to the wall, and it doesn't hurt to remind yourself by going there that one day there will be another temple. But I'm not looking at the tribulation temple. I'm looking at the one that in Ezekiel, in chapter 40, we're going to see when the Lord comes, he's going to be dwelling in that temple for a thousand years. So as I said, Yeshua fulfilled all these in part in his first coming. He will totally fulfill them in his second. To get this, go to Luke chapter 24. Remember when after the death of our Lord Yeshua and the resurrection, this is after the women had seen that he had risen from the dead, the tomb was empty. Two of the disciples of our Lord were going to Emmaus, which is about seven, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were discussing amongst themselves what had happened. And in verse 15, as they discussed, Yeshua comes up and walks along with them. They didn't know it was him. He asked them, what are you talking about? As if he didn't know, he knew. And they went ahead they were downcast, and Cleophas answered and said, Are you the only person staying in Jerusalem that doesn't know the things that have been going on there for the last few days? You see why I asked, What things? Yeah, right. And he went on to say, The things about Yeshua from Nazareth, he was a prophet and proved it by the things he did and said before God and all the people. But our priest, our leaders, handed him over so that he could be sentenced to death and executed. And we'd hoped he would be the one that would liberate Israel. Besides, today is the third day since these things happened. This morning, some of the women astounded us. They were at the tomb early, couldn't find his body, and they came back and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who say he's alive. Some of our friends went to the tomb, found it exactly like the woman said, but they didn't see him. Now Yeshua comes to them and says, Foolish people, so unwilling to put your trust in everything the prophet spoke, didn't the Messiah have to die like this before entering his glory? Now listen, starting with Moses, that's the Torah, and all the prophets, that's the Nevi'im, he explained to them all the things that could be found throughout the Tanakh. Now the word Tanakh is an acronym. The T sound of Tanakh is Torah. The N sound is Nevi'im, which means the prophet. The K sound is the Kethavim, or the writings, or the Psalms. The Tanakh is the Hebrew Scriptures, what is called by many the Old Testament. Yeshua had to go through the Old Testament and show them the Scriptures for them to be able to understand. Then in the upper room later, in Luke 24, 44, he said, this is what I meant when I was still with you and told you that everything written about me in the Torah of Moses, that's the T sound of Tanakh, the prophets, that's the end sound of Tanakh, and the Psalms, that's the K sound, or the Ketuvim, the writings, had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Tanakh, telling them, this is what it says, the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and in his name, repentance leading to forgiveness of sins. Now we have that Norim, uh, Yomim Norim, the days of all, the ten days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. We should be seeking forgiveness for our sins. We should be examining our lives. You know where the scripture says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting righteousness. So we should be examining ourselves during these ten days of awe to see where we have sinned in our life. How do we know? We have to compare our lives with what the Word says. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need to look through the eyes of the Word, through the light of the Word, at our lives and see where we need to repent, where we need to turn from our sins, where we need to turn back to Him. So repentance leading to forgiveness of sins, that's what Yom Kippur is. To be proclaimed to people from all nations, not just limited to Israel. Yom Kippur, back in the days of the temple, is where the scapegoat and the goat offered to the Lord were to be slaughtered. And where the sins of Israel would be forgiven. Here, all of us from all the nations, starting with Jerusalem, need to turn our hearts before our God, seek repentance for our sins. 
Because God's house is to be a house of prayer for what? All people. God wants us all. So let's look at proof of Yeshua's fulfillment of a fall holy day. I am toppling down. I am what I call an iconoclast. You know what an iconoclast is? It's a person who busts idols. And not only is Judaism full of idols, but so is Christianity. Now there's a story about Abraham. Way, way back when. Abraham was the son of an idol maker. One day, Abraham's father, according to Midrash, the stories, Abraham's father asked Abraham to mind the store. Of course, he came to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of course. And he knew that all these idols were false. So what he did while dad was gone is he went ahead and took an axe and he destroyed all the idols in the whole store except for one. The big one. And before his dad came back, the Midrash story goes, he put in the hands of the biggest idol, the one he did not destroy, he put in the hands of the idol, the axe. And when dad came back, dad said, what did you do, Abraham? You destroyed my whole business. And Abraham pointed at the big idol with the axe in its hands. And Abraham's father said, according to the story, you know that it's just clay. And Abraham smiled and nodded. You know that that idol can do nothing. You see, we need to give up our idolatry, folks, whatever that happens to be in our lives. And we need to turn to God. We need to turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need to repent of our sins. You know, you're not hearing a whole lot in the churches today, in America anyway, about sin. You hear it here, because you hear it there. We need to repent of our sin, and according to Scripture, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And here am I, Hineni. I'm the chiefest of sinners. You know why I say that? Because that's what Paul said. And if we truly look at our lives and we see where we have sinned. Just the other day I was talking to one of the women in our congregation who confessed the same thing. You see, we need to realize we are all sinners. And we all need somebody to redeem us. We all need somebody to forgive us. Every one of us. Let's look at the writer of the book of Hebrews. Some say Paul, some say somebody who was associated with Paul. One of the things I'll say is it probably was not Paul, but definitely somebody who was kind of associated with somebody or with Paul is because you're going to find a lot of Pauline phrases in the book of Hebrews. So whether or not Paul wrote it or not, I'll just simply say the writer of the book of Hebrews writes. The writer of the book of Hebrews, according to most scholars, wrote between 63 and 68 A.D. Paul was beheaded in about that time he was in Rome or a little bit earlier. I think it was 56 off the top of my head, but you know I'm getting old and forgetful. But the thing is, here's what the writer of the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.11. He's talking about our Lord Messiah. When the Messiah appeared as a Kohen Gadol. Kohen means priest, Gadol means big or huge. Or we might say the high priest. Of the good things that are happening already, then through a greater, more perfect tent, which is not man-made, that's in the heavenlies, that is not created in this world. He entered the holiest place once and for all. Now you're going to see this phrase, once for all, in the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, the high priest is supposed to not go into the Holy of Holies except once a year. This is where Yom Kippur is being set up. Now it says here that, first of all, before he can go in, he has to offer atonement for himself and the people. Before he can go in and offer atonement for the sins of the people, he has to deal with his own sin first. And then it says he can go in 
and make those offerings for atonement for the sins of the people. And it says here <coughs> that in verse number 30 of Leviticus 16, from, for on this day atonement, and from the Hebrew word kippur, which we get from the Hebrew word kafar, which means pitch. If you go back to Genesis chapter 9, you're going to see that Noah built his ark, and on the outside he was commanded to put kafar on it. He was commanded to put pitch on it. We get kippur from kafar which means pitch. And it says, you will be clean before Adonai from some of your sins. No. All. A-L-L. All your sins. Now, listen to this closely. How many times is the high priest allowed to go in to atone for the sins of the people for all their sins? Once. For how many of their sins? All. It goes on to say then, this is a permanent regulation for you to make atonement for the people of Israel because of all their sins once a year. There's your once for all. How many times did Yeshua have to go into heaven and offer his blood for all of our sins? Once. For how many of our sins? All. All. So when we look at the writer of the book of Hebrews, he's saying that Yeshua entered into the holiest place in heavenly once for all. Now he's saying, he's not saying here he's doing away with any of these offerings. He isn't. In other words, when you see Paul doing the Nazarite vow, he even does a sin offering. He's willing to do the sin offering because that's in Numbers chapter 6. So the sin offering has not been done away with by the death of our Lord Yeshua. Even though the death of our Lord Yeshua made atonement for our sins once and for all. But he entered by the means of his own blood, setting people free forever. Hebrews 9.24, for the Messiah has entered a holiest place, that's the Holy of Holies, which is not man-made and merely a copy of the true one better to heaven itself. Furthermore, he did not enter into heaven to offer himself over and over and over again, like the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, who enters the holiest place year after year with blood not his own. For then Yeshua would have had to suffer death many times from the founding of the universe on. But as it is, he has appeared once at the end of the ages in order to do away with sin through the sacrifice of himself. So, this is just a little touch on how Yeshua fulfilled one fall feast in his first coming. He fulfilled the Yom Kippur sacrifice once and for all. Now, I will tell you something interesting. This is the only feast that I could not, uh, not feast, fast, actually. This is the only holy day that I would not find anywhere in the scripture that's being offered during the thousand-year reign. All the other ones are, I guarantee you. All the other ones, the Olah offerings, the Chata'at, the sin offerings, all these are being offered during the thousand-year reign. That's after the death of our Lord Yeshua and the resurrection. But the one that is taken care of once for all is only Yom Kippur. And I've got proof of that. I've got proof independent of the Bible of that. Now, when Yeshua is on the cross, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon... The land was covered with darkness, Matthew 27, 45. He yells in a loud cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you deserted me? Psalm 22, by the way, that's a remiss, a hint. He's saying to them around him, if you want to know what's going on here, go to Psalm 22. You're going to read all about it. Advanced copy of a prophet. Immediately, well, somebody ran and took a sponge, soaked it in vinegar and so forth. Said, well, let's see if Elihu, Eliyahu, that's Elijah, comes and rescues him. But it says in verse number 50, but Yeshua, again crying out in a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. Now, follow me with this very closely. How many times did the high priest go into the Holy of Holies? 
once. And how did he get through, into the Holy of Holies? Through the parakeet, through the curtain, through the dividing wall. At that moment, when Yeshua yielded up his spirit, it says in verse 51, the parakeet in the temple was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. And if I were that priest standing there offering the incense, I would be frightened. Because what that did was open it up. Now a regular priest would not be allowed to even look into the Holy of Holies, and even the high priest only once a year. This priest, if he were a regular priest, he'd be terrified. And he's only a regular priest, and I'll surmise he's a regular priest, because what time frame was this occurring? Passover. It was not occurring on Yom Kippur. The only time a high priest ever came and he had to do all the things that a regular priest would do, the only time the high priest would be in there is on Yom Kippur. Well, this is not Yom Kippur when Yeshua died. It was Passover. There is a connection, but not enough time. You probably noticed. There was an earthquake with rocks splitting apart. Now, Here's my extra biblical proof that something profound happened to the temple. Isn't that profound? That ripping, that's big time profound. But look, the Talmud, which is not canon scripture, it's really commentary. There were two Talmudim, two of them. One was Yerushalayim, and the other was Bavli, which is Jerusalem. There was the Jerusalem Talmud, and there was the Babylonian Talmud. It notes that 40 years before the destruction of the temple, anybody in math will know that if the temple was destroyed in 70, which it was by Titus, gee, why do you think I've been going through all this church history, folks? Not just because I like to talk. It's because you need to know how to place this stuff. So, 70, Titus destroyed the temple. Please, subtract 30. Uh, subtract 40, I'm sorry. I was jumping ahead to the, the product there. What year did Yeshua die? 30. 30. I know scholars argue about that, but scholars argue about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> the Talmud. In the centuries following the destruction of the temple, and we talked about that during my church history thing, there were two versions of the Talmud. The Jerusalem one, as I just said, and the Babylonian one. Here's what Jacob Neusner, who wrote about the Yerushalayim, that's the Babylonian Talmud, in his book on page 156 and 157. Forty years before the destruction of the temple, the western light went out, the crimson thread remained crimson, and the lot for the Lord always came up in the left hand. They would close the gates of the temple by night and get up in the morning and find them wide open. Similar passage in the Babylonian Talmud. Our rabbis taught during the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the lot for the Lord did not come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson colored strap become right, white, nor did the westernmost light shine, and the doors of the hecho of the temple would open by themselves. Now let's talk about the miracle of the lot. The priest had to reach in, the high priest had to reach in and grab a, a lot, which is a oh, sort of like just, you know, picking up a lot. One was for Adonai, for the Lord, and the other was Le'azazel, which means for the scapegoat. This lot was drawn on Yom Kippur. And that lot was going to determine which goat was Le'adonai and which one was Le'azazel. And statistically, during the 200 years before 30, when the high priest picked one of the two stones, Again, this selection was governed by chance. You know, kind of like a 50-50 thing. And each year the priest would select the black stone as often as the white stone. But for 40 years in a row, beginning with 30, the high priest always picked the black stone. Now the odds against this are astronomical. One in approximately 5,479,548,800, or basically about 5.5 billion to one. The lot for Azazel, the black stone, contrary to all the laws of chance, came up 40 times in a row from the year 30 to 70. 
That is virtually impossible for happening. And yet, this is what is noted in the Talmud. Now, the miracle of the red strip. Both goats were given a red sash to put on their horns. One was offered in, its blood was offered inside the Holy of Holies. The other one, let Azazel, had a sash as well, and part of that sash was cut off. It was a crimson sash, and it was nailed to the door of the temple. Now, when that goat was thrown off the cliff by a priest, if the Yom Kippur sacrifice was accepted by the Lord, then the one on nailed to the door of the temple would turn white. But what happened beginning in the year 30 is the fact is that the, the sash that was nailed to the temple door never turned white again. Never. Now, you know, these guys that are writing the Talmud are not friends of Yeshua. They're the ones that actually were the ones that were against Yeshua. So why are they confirming in the Talmud? Why are they confirming more for who Yeshua is and what he did? But what that meant, since the cloth did not change, it means that after the year 30, when Yeshua died, the Yom Kippur sacrifice in the temple was not accepted by the Lord. Well, of course. It was not accepted by the Lord because the Lord provided his own sacrifice of his own land. And the Yom Kippur sacrifice remained of no effect. Meaning that Israel's sins were not being pardoned and being made white. So if they didn't get atonement, they got judgment. If they didn't get atonement, they got judgment. So when you read in Isaiah 118, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will be white as wool. He was talking about an actual event that happened on Yom Kippur. If the sins of the people were forgiven, then it would turn white. This is a clear indication that the whole community had lost the Lord's attention in relationship to something that occurred in the year 30. Hmm. Miracle of the temple doors. The next miracle which the Jewish authorities acknowledged was that the temple door swung open every night on its own accord. This too occurred for 40 years, beginning in the year 30. The leading Jewish authority at that time, Yochanan, uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai, declared that this was a sign of impending doom, that the temple itself would be destroyed. Said the rabbi, O oh, temple, why do you frighten us? We know that you will end up destroyed. For it has been said, open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. From Zechariah 11, 1. Now, let me say something. If the gates to a city were left open at night, then the enemy will come in. So that's why the rabbi went ahead and said, this is portending, this is looking at the destruction of the temple. The miracle of the temple menorah. Every night for 40 years, over 12,500 nights in a row, the main lamp of the temple lampstand or the menorah went out on its own accord, no matter what they did to try to keep it lit. Again, the odds against that lamp continually going out are astronomical, folks. That means the light of the menorah representing contact with God and his spirit is now removed. So what we're seeing here is a pointing toward the crucifixion of the Yom Kippur sacrifice in 70 CE. That meant that in the year 30, Yeshua died and was the acceptable Yom Kippur sacrifice because nothing following that was ever accepted again. You know what we're seeing here? We're seeing fulfillment. And that's why I brought Luke 24 in. Yeshua fulfilled these. Now, I hope I have set to rest. Thank you, John. I hope I have set to rest what you've probably heard or read that the Lord only fulfilled the spring feast in his first coming. No. 
he completely fulfilled and really did away with the efficacy of Yom Kippur in his first coming.